Welcome. Thank you for joining us. We're going to get started in just a moment. In the meantime, you can let us know in the chat, chat your name and where you're joining us from. Welcome. For those of you that just joined, you can let us know your name and where you're joining us from in the chat box. We're going to wait just a minute for a few more folks to filter in and then we'll get started. Wonderful. Well, it is just about noon, so we are going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us and celebrating World Migratory Bird Day. Uh, my name is Kayla Clark, and I coordinate public programs for UGA Marine Extension and Georgia Sea Grant. Um, and so I'll be your moderator today. You will also be hearing from Abby, Sergio, and Katie, um, and we'll meet them a little bit later. But before we get started, just a couple of quick Zoom tips to help it run smoothly. This is webinar, so you will notice that your video and your sound is off and will stay off for the duration of the program. We do still wanna hear from you. Uh, we wanna get your questions and then we've got some questions for you as well. Um, so the way you can interact with us is either through the chat and or the Q&A box. So depending on your device, go ahead and look at either the bottom or the top of your screen. If you see the word chat and click on that, that's where you can write comments. That's where you can respond to our questions to you. And then you'll also see a Q&A button if you click on there, that's the best place to put any questions that you have for us. Um, if you're on a smaller device, you might need to look for the three dots or the word more and click on that to get those two options of chat or Q&A. I also want to mention that we are recording the program. Um, again, your you know, voice and, and face will not show up in the recording, but all of our presenters will, and we'll post that to YouTube uh, typically within two to three weeks after the live event. Um, so don't feel like you have to take copious notes. You will have a recording you can refer to um, a little bit later on. Um, and the last thing that, that I'll say is just that it's not truly World Migratory Bird Day today, it's tomorrow. So we hope that you get all excited today and then tomorrow uh, get out and explore and celebrate all of the really wonderful birds that are stopping here in Georgia. Um, but this is a much larger event all around the world. People are celebrating uh, birds of many different species that are moving around the globe. Um, and we're pretty lucky here to have a number of different shorebirds that, that use Georgia as a stopover site. So with that, to tell us more about uh, shorebirds and why the Georgia coast is so important for them, I'm going to introduce the director of the Georgia Bite Shorebird Conservation Initiative with Manomet, Abby Sterling. All right. All right. Um, I am going to um, start this presentation. Did that work? Can you give me just a thumbs up if you see the actual slides instead of presenter view? Great. Thanks so much. Um, well, um, I am so excited. Thank you so much. Um, for setting this up, Kayla and Katie, um, we're really excited to get to celebrate World Migratory Bird Day and talk about um, my favorite of the migrants, and that's shorebirds. Um, one of the reasons that I think shorebirds are so incredible is because they really do connect people um, across the entire hemisphere. And so just this afternoon, I wanted to briefly talk a little bit about the important role of the Georgia coast and then talk a little bit about what's going on with shorebirds as they migrate. It is pretty incredible. Um, we cannot talk about spring in the shorebird world without talking a little bit about um, some of the other exciting things that are happening this time of year, and that means shorebird nesting. And then um, finally, we're going to just talk briefly about uh, the, some of the challenges um, that shorebirds face and why conservation of, of shorebirds is so important. Um, so as a quick setting of the stage, um, I always love this slide because it shows exactly what makes the Georgia coast such an important place for shorebirds. Georgia is part of the Georgia Bight, which ranges from Cape Hatteras down to Cape Canaveral. Um, and you all may know this already, but one of the reasons that the, the, our shoreline looks the way that it does is because of all of the different geographic features that happen as a result of being a part of this Georgia Bight. 
So a bite is just a curved part of the coastline, and we are located here in Georgia, kind of in the center part of the bite. That means we're quite far from the edge of the continental shelf, and because of that, we have very low wave energy, this bar here showing you wave height, and because of the curved part of the coast, we have really high tides. So we have a six to eight foot tidal range. So this dotted line here will show you that. So that means as we get close to the coast, uh, middle part of the bite here, we have low wave energy, high tidal range. That makes us, uh, helps, helps build out our uh, barrier islands. So they're nice, thick barrier islands. And it also means that we have huge expanded sandbars and mud flats for shorebirds to feed on. We also have a lot of inlets. As you can see here, inlets are places where river systems are dumping out into the ocean, and those inlets are spaced really close together as you get towards the middle part of the bite. And so that means um, that within the Georgia Bight, we have basically the perfect recipe for shorebirds. We have these extensive remote barrier island beaches, and then this really high tidal range, which creates huge expanses of mud flats uh, and sand flats. And all of those places hold the invertebrates, the polychaete worms, the bivalves, the little coquina clams, abundant food resources for shorebirds. Then we've got the Altamaha River, Savannah River, all these really large drainages and river estuaries pumping out tons of nutrients and lots of sediment to the coastline. And that also helps build up all of these habitats that shorebirds rely on. A couple other neat things that we have in the Southeast and, and particularly along Georgia's coast is we have pretty minimal amounts of shoreline engineering. So relatively uh, low amounts of like hardened shoreline. You can think about what the Florida coast looks like and compare it to the Georgia coast and you can kind of get an idea um, of what we're talking about there. Those natural shorelines are really important for shorebirds. And then we also have a lot of areas with limited disturbance. Many of the islands and sandbars are pretty hard to access. And we have a lot of impoundments and managed wetlands that provide habitat for shorebirds throughout the year as well. So this is kind of the perfect recipe for shorebirds. And it's one of the reasons that we can support significant numbers of shorebirds throughout the entire year. So we have migration season, which is happening right now from March to May. Um, and in the fall, that will be from August to October. We have wintering shorebirds like piping plovers that spend the winter here with us from about October to March. And then we have the nesting season as well from March to September. So really at any point during the calendar year, you can see some very cool, important things going on with shorebirds on the Georgia coast. Um, because we are such an important place for shorebirds, we were designated um, as a uh, landscape of hemispheric importance. Um, the Georgia Barrier Islands um, a couple years ago were designated as a landscape of hemispheric importance by the Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network which is a program that's housed uh, within Manomet. The Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network connects sites across the whole entire North, South, Central America uh, to protect important critical places for shorebirds. And those sites are actually designated because of the numbers of shorebirds that they support. So here, the Georgia Barrier Islands support roughly uh, 300,000 shorebirds every single year. And many of these shorebirds are migrating tremendous distances. And so um, I think shorebirds really are sort of the poster child for what migration looks like in the air. Um, you can see this image down here on the left shows you tracks of, of individual birds that have been outfitted with transmitters going from South America up to nesting regions in the Arctic. And so when we're talking about migration, we're talking about the movement of a whole entire population generally from the Southern Hemisphere to the Northern Hemisphere to take advantage of weather conditions and food resources. Um, shorebirds migrate along what are called flyways. And so we are part of the Atlantic Flyway, which is this pink swath right here. There's also the Central Flyway in yellow and the Pacific Flyway in blue. So many shorebirds do have annual migrations, but one of the best well-known examples is the red knot. And, um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about the red knot in particular. Um, red knot travel, some of them, from the very southern part of South America down here, sites like Tierra del Fuego, all the way up to nesting grounds in the Arctic in the spring. And they do this through a series of just several hops to key sites 
um, like the Southeast, uh, where they stop to feed and rest. And on these tremendous journeys, they will actually double their body weight. Um, their digestive organs will shrink down, their lung and heart muscles will, will get larger. Um, and they basically spend all their time at these stopover places, just feeding and resting. Um, and so they've got some incredible physiological adaptations so that they can actually complete these journeys where they're flying several days, nonstop, over water, not eating, not drinking. Um, they sleep with like hemispheric portion of their brain will go to sleep and half of it will stay awake. Um, and, and the incredible thing to think about, the red knot is about the size of a robin um, and that bird will fly thousands of miles without stopping, flapping its wings the whole entire time. And one of the things that they desperately need when they're on these migrations is safe places to stop. And so um, here on the Georgia coast, we provide that. We've got good food resources and good disturbance-free places for them to rest. Um, shorebirds that are migrating exhibit what's called site fidelity. So year after year, they'll actually come back to the very same location and they will stop there to feed and rest. We know this primarily because of one um, marked red knot uh, probably the most famous red knot, and that's a, a bird whose name was B95. It was banded down in Argentina, and it flew every year up to Delaware Bay, and it was recited on that journey for nearly 20 years. And during that time frame, it flew from essentially the distance from the Earth to the moon and back. Um, red knots and many other migratory shorebirds are showing some pretty significant population declines. The Rufa red knot was actually listed as federally threatened. One very important food resource for red knots is horseshoe crab eggs. So in the spring, we have horseshoe crabs spawning like this image here. They lay eggs, they're about the size of a BB. And the Southeast is a really important place for them as well. Delaware Bay is probably one of the most well-known places where horseshoe crabs are spawning and those horseshoe crab eggs are fueling that migration. But there's new research that's uh, been done out of uh, South Carolina by biologist Felicia Sanders and she actually tagged some birds. You can see them down here in, in pink and they're jetting up. And a, a number of those birds, nearly two thirds of them are actually going up to the Arctic rather than moving up to Delaware Bay. So for a long time, it was thought that every single red knot went to Delaware Bay, but now we're learning Southeast has enough food resources to fill up those birds and get them all the way up to the Arctic, which is pretty incredible. The other cool thing about migratory shorebirds is that they essentially lead a double life. This is something I always love to think about. So when we see migratory shorebirds here in the spring, red knots, dunlin, uh, semi-palmated sandpipers, they are all about eating and sleeping. But when they get up to the Arctic, they've got a whole lot of other things they need to do. First of all, when they get to the Arctic, there might be snow on the ground. So they have to have enough energy to take them all the way up to the Arctic and then survive until the snow melts. But the other thing they have to do is they have to find a mate find a territory and raise their young. So when these shorebirds go up to the Arctic, they actually sing, which I think is incredible. And I am going to try really hard to see if I can um, play this Dunlin song for you. They're one of our most common wintering shorebirds. In the spring, they get this little black belly, but when they go up to the Arctic, they actually sing. And it sounds like this. Hopefully you heard that. Um, and so you can picture this little guy does a really cool hovering flight display over its breeding ground to try to woo the ladies. Red knots, these red guys up here, also have a song when they get to the Arctic. And um, that sounds like this. Which is so cool, right? Like we don't ever think of shorebirds as birds that sing when they go up to the Arctic, at the other side of the coin, suddenly they're all decked out in breeding plumage, trying to woo the ladies, setting up territories and singing songs and having flight displays. And I always think about this too, when I think of this guy who is blending in perfectly in the Arctic. But when we see them here in Georgia, we know them as a ready turnstone and they stand out like a, not like a sore thumb because they're so beautiful, but they're so brightly patterned. Um, if you only see them in Georgia, I think you look at them and you say, what in the world is that bird dressed the way that it's dressed for? And it's dressed that way to go up to the Arctic. So the ready turnstone is a really cool one. Remember the ready turnstone, because I think we're going to maybe have 
um, an opportunity for you all to try to decide what shorebird you would be. Ruddy turnstones are pretty feisty. They have a lot of attitude and they're also pretty bold. They're not really afraid to try out new things. And they've got a very cool little bill for actually flipping stones over and eating invertebrates. So ruddy turnstone, very cool, migratory, travels all the way up the hemisphere and goes up to the Arctic to nest. Another very neat migratory shorebird I wanted to introduce you to as well is the wimbrel. These guys migrate from Brazil and then in the springtime we see huge numbers of them coming in to eat fiddler crabs. So they love to eat crabs and they are pretty territorial during the day. They just hang out by themselves eating crabs but every single night they have big parties. They go out to sandbars offshore where they can be safe uh, from predators and they will gather by the hundreds and thousands at just a few remote sites where they can be safe during the night. So that's pretty cool. The other thing I wanted to touch on just quickly is that it's nesting season right now. And so that's very exciting. These birds are not long distance migrants, but it is worth noting that right now we've got nesting happening on our beaches. And so several different shorebird species nest on our beaches, but two of the main priority species are oyster catchers with the oyster catcher nest right here and Wilson's plover with a Wilson's plover nest right here. They nest right out on the open sand. It's really important when you're spending time on the beach to make sure that you stay down below the tide line on the wet sand and really watch where you go if you happen to go out to any of the remote shell rakes or sandbars because they also nest in places like that. Um, although oyster catchers are not migratory, many of them are banded and we see some movement that we previously didn't even think uh, was happening where some of our oyster catchers that are banded in Georgia are actually going down and spending time in Central America. So that's really cool. Oyster catchers are great parents. They love to eat oysters. That bill is specially adapted to help them eat oysters and they'll bring food in to their chicks um, throughout the summer. So it's fun to watch them. And if you happen to see pairs of oyster catchers right now, pay close attention because they might be hiding chicks and they may be bringing food to them. The other beach nesting species is Wilson's plover. And they are much smaller, harder to see, but these guys have, I think, pretty serious attitude. They're really cool. Um, they've got this big bill so that they can eat fiddler crabs as well. And they are also very dedicated parents. As soon as the chicks hatch from their nests, they leave and they start moving around on the beach together in little family units. Um, and so they're um, very dedicated families and, and protect their chicks really well. So I wanted to wrap up with just talking quickly about shorebird conservation. Um, we see some very significant declines in shorebird populations, particularly among long distance migrating shorebirds. And that's because they need um, some very specific things. Many of these shorebirds gather in large groups at specific places during migration to feed and to rest and they exhibit site fidelity. So that means every single spot that a shorebird needs on its annual journey across the entire hemisphere is critically important. If it loses any of those places, you can have some pretty uh, serious population implications. They also cross these huge geographic areas. And so that means there needs to be state cooperation, uh, national cooperation, and international cooperation between all the different partners that manage the sites that shorebirds need. And when we think about the places that shorebirds depend on, they are already pretty uh, imperiled. You know, coasts are one of the quicker developing uh, types of, of land, and these shorebirds also require very specific food resources um, that are at risk because of climate change, contamination, and disturbance. So um, some very serious problems that we have to think of at the large scale when we think about shorebird conservation. A little bit closer to home, there's some pretty big issues as well that threaten Jordan shorebirds. Um, disturbance from recreational use of beaches and remote places that shorebirds need can make those places uh, unavailable for shorebirds who are trying to nest there or feed there. Habitat loss, climate change, and low reproductive success. It's not all doom and gloom because we have a lot of really great tools at our disposal in our toolbox um, to try to help address some of these big challenges. Things like partnership, education and outreach, research and coordinated management um, are all tools that we can use to try to better understand the threats that face shorebirds here on the Georgia coast and implement strategies to help protect those places that shorebirds need. And so um, that is um, really leading in very well to um, some of the work 
that Sergio is doing, and then exactly what Katie's going to be talking about as well towards the end. Some of the different things that are going on to really make a difference for shorebirds. And so with that, I will hand the screen over to Sergio. Wonderful, thank you, Abby. Um, before we hand it over to Sergio, uh, a lot of times the conservation of these shorebirds among the public is all about having that direct personal connection with one. So we're gonna launch a quick poll to see if you were gonna be a shorebird for a day, which of these shorebirds would you be? And your options are, and give me the pictures so you can remember what they look like. Um, the Wilson's Plover, the Wimbrel, the Ruddy Turnstone, or the American Oyster Catcher. I forgot the different characteristics that Abby mentioned, but I didn't remember that the Ruddy Turnstones are feisty. So if you think you're feisty, that might be the choice for you. Um, I'm gonna launch the poll now. Um, and so there's your options. Abby, if there's any other like personality traits, general characteristics that you want to add for any of the others. I feel like maybe a Wimbrel is kind of a loner, but they also really like to hang out with their best buddies to feel safe. And so that's that's cool. Um, oyster catchers love to eat oysters and um, they are um, very charismatic, pretty, pretty cool social bird. Wilson's clovers are really good families. They, the parents protect their chicks and they kind of travel around together. Um, and they are also another one with some attitude. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you for those, <laughs> those details. I see that most people have voted. We're going to leave it open for like two more seconds. Um, our panelists cannot vote, but I am seeing in the chat that um, Katie would be a Wilson's Plover. I think I'd like to be an American Oyster Catcher. All right, get your last vote in if you haven't yet, and I'm gonna go ahead and end polling and share results. <laughs> we may have given Ready Turnstones a bad uh, reputation because no one wanted to be a ready turnstone, but a mix of Wilson's Plovers, Wimbrels, and American Oyster Catchers in the group, um, which is great because uh, Sergio is going to talk a little bit more about Plovers. Um, so Sergio Sabonia is uh, the Georgia Sea Grant State Fellow, or one of one of them this year, who has been working with um, Georgia Audubon and as well as Jekyll Island Authority. Um, so we're excited to hear more about the work that he's done and about those birds in particular. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to him. Yeah, thank you. I guess I would be the Wimbro. I just wanted to point that out. Uh, but other than that, yeah, it's been a quite a, a interesting experience so far. Uh, as uh, everyone has said, shorebirds are very interesting, and, and I've pretty much started with them uh, from the start. So if I'm able to do it, I feel like everyone can tag along and, and enjoy their, uh, their magnificence on the beach. Uh, so for the next slide, yeah, so a little bit of background from where I am. Uh, this accent uh, comes from Puerto Rico. I, I was born in Puerto Rico, pretty much had a childhood within a tropical oasis, uh, the ideal scenario uh, for a vacation, uh, as I've learned moving around the US. Uh, and having grown among like these unique uh, ecosystem, it was a saddening realization uh, knowing that they're being destroyed as uh, sadly all across the, uh, the world faster than, than scientists can conduct any research uh, to understand them. Uh, so as I left my island uh, to start my academic career uh, in the US and, and was able to find different opportunities uh, to help me explore and expand my curiosity of the natural world, I started to uh, find more uh, interest on uh, the science route uh, and from these uh, opportunities, I was able to move uh, to the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, uh, around northern Texas, uh, into the Oklahoma prairies, uh, Mount Shenandoah Mountains of Virginia. Uh, and before coming to Georgia, uh, I was living up in uh, by Lake Erie uh, in the beach maple forest of Ohio. Uh, so just based on my short career, I've been able to explore a lot, uh, which has been very interesting. Uh, but into the next slide, uh, but yeah, these experiences have clearly uh, shown me the wide gap in funding and research into environmental causes that I see comparing my uh, background in Puerto Rico to the US, uh, but also the discrepancies in the accessibility to nature, uh, natural spaces, and uh, that are mostly deeply rooted sad, uh, suddenly, 
uh, along racial and socioeconomical uh, lines. So these experiences as a whole, uh, being in nature and then seeing these discrepancies pretty much led me to pursue my degree in biology to clearly not only keep uh, exploring and expanding my curiosity of the natural world, but to also be a part of the movement of making, uh, helping make nature accessible and understandable to all. Uh, currently, uh, not only am I the, the Georgia Sea Grant Fellow, but I'm also finishing up my master's degree at Georgia Southern University. Uh, here I'm studying the effects of water level on wetlands and how these aquatic insects, as you see down in the bottom, we see uh, uh, the far, at least from my view, the one on the far right would be uh, chironomid. So these would be a non-biting midge. Uh, so these one might be the ones that are a little bit annoying and they get into your eyes, but they don't bite. They're not the ones that you have to run from around 6 p.m. in the coast. Uh, the other one on the middle, that's a, a larvae from a, pretty much a, an aquatic uh, beetle. Um, pretty much they're top predators along uh, my area. And also you can see, uh, I have to go sample uh, in the wetlands covered in algae and everything. And uh, to the far left, you can see some of the, uh, my encounters uh, with the locals uh, that I've clearly never seen before until I moved to this area of the US, uh, the alligator. So it's been an interesting path to live uh, and do research here in Georgia so far. And now that I've transitioned a little bit into uh, studying shorebirds, it's been even more, I've been able to see clearly my background not being birds, being able to see the linkages uh, between insects or inverts as a whole, as Katie was talking about, and how the shorebirds feed on these echinoderms uh, uh, and other uh, either crustaceans or other invertebrates along the beach. So it's what in my, my, uh, my understanding of these uh, natu like natural interests uh, and into the next slide. And in terms of my fellowship, uh, some of the goals, uh, clearly working with Jekyll Island Authority, uh, in there I'm, I'm, I was given the task of setting up and conducting pipe and plover monitoring uh, along these shorelines. The pipe and plover being uh, a very cute, small little uh, plover that uh, migrates more along the northern uh, portion of, of North America. But we see them come, uh, at least from my interest, one of the populations that uh, we see the most uh, is based out of the Great Lakes. And one specifically that I was able to spot uh, this year, uh, the name was Esperanza. And this was one of the ones that uh, pretty much uh, their nest, they were nesting right on the edge of uh, Chicago along the downtown area. So it was a very interesting, just to even know that we're getting uh, these very, very cute small birds, even though not doing uh, a wide migration pattern, still seeing them here. Uh, so it's been a very interesting uh, thing to know just from uh, that perspective. And another point, another task that I have in my fellowship is conducting and improving some of the Wilson plover monitoring uh, uh, for the nest as, uh, Kate, as uh, Abby showed, and also doing uh, conducting the international shorebird surveys that Manomet uh, started along the Jekyll Island shoreline. For Georgia Audubon, I'm exploring areas of conservation on community engagement opportunities as they expand along the Georgia coast. And I'll talk about a little bit more in terms of uh, these two groups and what I'm doing on the next slides. Yeah, so, so bring the, the next slide. So in Jekyll Island, uh, if you haven't visited this uh, state park, pretty much it's right next to uh, 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 St. Simon's Island. Uh, and, and within that, uh, one of their key mission is, is being stewards of the present and past, uh, present, past and future, uh, maintaining the delicate balance between human and uh, uh, in their uh, nature. And in here, uh, pretty much, I've, again, I've been uh, working with them, uh, pretty much learning from the start uh, to develop uh, a guiding document for Jekyll Island Authority to better understand where to allocate resources that will best support all shorebirds, but specifically the ones nesting, kind of like the Wilson's plover uh, and also the wintering piping plover that I've already spoken to through their migrations. And uh, for the other slide, And yeah, and for Georgia Audubon, this uh, used to be named uh, Atlanta Audubon. They started in the 1970s. Uh, and then through their expansion, uh, trying uh, from the Metro Atlanta area, 
uh, with their mission of protecting Georgia's birds and their habitats as they try to benefit both humans and birds. Uh, through their success, they wanted to expand this past year, this past August, uh, to cover all of the Georgia uh, area and help support all these, uh, uh, promote and expand the efforts to build and con uh, conservation-minded Georgia in which birds can, pro uh, can prosper, habitats flourish, and communities across the state are fully engaged. So within these two groups, uh, it's been very interesting uh, experience because uh, from one side, I'm, I've been seeing how, uh, at least from the Jekyll Island uh, Authority work, I've been seeing how a conservation plan starts from the beginning. It's not only uh, gathering the science, the data, and, and providing a, a document saying what has to be done, but it's also pretty much the, the, the different steps and the different uh, discussions I have to go through uh, just to build uh, that plan and also implement that. So, so pretty much for me to be able to be working on the beach and looking at uh, these shorebirds, there's have there's been so many steps for this implementation of the plan. Uh, and this is something that uh, I guess before here I was oblivious of, and and now uh, as I part uh, and my fellowship, I'll be taking these. Uh, uh, clear messages uh, about the importance of not only doing science, but being able to implement that and, and being able to uh, express it in a, in a way that everyone can understand the way it creates for better plants and better uh, communities. Uh, and into the next slide. And then, yeah, so as what we have here, the shorebirds, again, I started pretty much from a background of inverts. So this has been, clearly I knew a little bit about birds, but not as, enough to, to to even comprehend the span of migratory patterns, what we've seen or a lot. So it's been a very interesting uh, year so far, pretty much spending a lot of time on the beach, uh, looking at these birds. As you can see here, uh, some of them are quite uh, uh, visible. Some of them, as you see on the far right, that's a piping plover. So these, again, these are the ones, one of the ones that I'm focused to the most. And you can see how they easily blend into the sand uh, and how, to a degree, how hard it is to spot. So it's been very, very cool, but it's also challenging to, to not only know what bird I'm looking at, just also know where to find them. Uh, and from there, uh, at least from the International Shorebird Survey that I'm doing, I have to count along the shoreline, I have to count each bird that I'm seeing, each individual bird. So as a, uh, within a, a group, as you see right in the middle, it's kind of hard to, to find even the, the, the start and the end. So it's, it's been a very, uh, very, very cool, uh, experience so far and, and with the help of uh, Ben Carswell, Yank Moore, uh, Ray Emerson, as well as Joseph, uh, 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 I his last name, sorry, uh, Joseph Colbert, uh, here working in the Coastal Operation Department of Jekyll Island, but also with Abby has provided me a lot of help uh, through this time. Uh, Tim Kais, uh, Stephen Fletcher, uh, all these uh, all these people have given me enough support uh, to just to be able to start and be able to to continue with these work. Uh, so into the next slide. And then from here, this is more uh, you seeing at least to a component, seeing how they interact and some of the key parts of being able to conduct a survey for shorebirds that I've realized. As you see right on the top uh, right. Uh, this is not a direct shorebird to say, but this is uh, one of the ones that I've been focusing on as well, uh, at least helping uh, the DNR uh, with banding uh, and recite. This would be a black skimmer on the top. And then from the bottom, you can see on their feet, uh, there's some bands. So this is a whole other thing that I've <laughs> had to realize how to even uh, start adding the information from a band. What, uh, uh, how do you read it? From there, you start seeing uh, on the bottom, uh, uh, in the middle, uh, some of the predators that they, that they uh, have to avoid. So you, you, as a group, you start seeing how the birds interact not only with each other, but also respond to outside uh, influences, either human or uh, do be that uh, predators, but also how they easily blend in. This has been clearly for me the most entertaining and also in a degree frustrating thing about my experience is being able to 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 know what bird I'm seeing at a distance and, and, and be able to see where they are. Uh, so it's been very rewarding experience just to even uh, be able to point out what a, a piping plover is uh, and then it's not a, a semi-palmated plover. 
so within the matter of pretty much eight months, I feel like I've been able to, to grasp it a little bit more than, than I thought. Uh, so into the next slide. And then here, I'm going to show you pretty much a day-to-day -day or weekly uh, basis of my, my, my fellowship. Here, I'm riding a, a, an electric scoot, uh, bike that uh, Jekyll Island Authority has provided me to conduct their surveys. Uh, it's been a very, very cool experience. And here, it's kind of like a glimpse of, of what uh, I, I do uh, in my day-to-day. -day. Uh, so not only ride the cool bike along the beach, uh, pretty much stopping anywhere I see a uh, shorebird, uh, and documenting it, but in here you see me with the scope and a full row. I don't know if it portrays, but uh, a full row of shorebirds in there. Here we're seeing the oyster catchers, which have been one of the coolest birds I've seen in my life, just with that long uh, orange bill. And pretty much I see them as the most chill birds, but as you might see in the later on the video, you see them change. This is another good one in terms of their uh, capacity to blend into the environment. At the beginning of my uh, Fellowship, I pretty much would have uh, gone through this area and not expected to see a bird. But as, as through time, I started to, to, to clearly uh, see more of the details and, and you can start seeing some, uh, bir my, some birds eating uh, along the, this tidal line. Uh, so it's been very cool. Here you start seeing those uh, ruddy turnstones and they're definitely, I see them in low quantities, but whenever I do see them, they're very interesting just to Pretty much view and see how they interact with the environment. Uh, they're definitely very curious. I haven't seen their bad side yet, so hopefully I can uh, I can avoid that. <laughs> Here we see a bunch of uh, uh, sanderlings, and uh, a little bit in the background we still see some of those uh, uh, ruddy turnstones. But again, this is what uh, has been my joy. Pretty much every week has been going to the uh, walking along the beach and just with my scope being able to see how they interact and what they're eating. This is another portion of, of my fellowship that I've been able to, to attend uh, with DNR, uh, with also Manomet and Abby, uh, seeing how they catch and ban, uh, at least in this occasion, it would be oyster catchers. So just the whole process of how they gather data, again, they implement a conservation plan, at least from here, the, the, through the Georgia DNR, how they gather, gather all this information uh, just to know what, how the health of the population uh, and then at least uh, in this portion right now, it's one of my uh, current duties going through the nesting areas of Wilson Clover along the southern portion of uh, Jekyll Island. Here we see Yank Moore uh, uh, putting the egg on water. And this is just one of their ways of, of measuring or estimating the, the age of the eggs just to see uh, in what frame they, they, we would expect to see chicks. And this is again, one of the coolest birds I've met. and. Uh, I'll definitely keep that uh, selfie in my history to show my <laughs> my family. And all you're seeing here is all these groups of red uh, red knots. Uh, at least in that day, I already I counted almost 500 in that area. So it's been a really really cool experience. I feel very very lucky just to even had the opportunity to to have this fellowship and and even learn about these birds uh, and everything. So. I definitely appreciate you hearing me and, and uh, I appreciate uh, Georgia Sea Grant for giving me the, the opportunity to do this fellowship in uh, Jaco Island as well as uh, uh, Georgia Audubon. Thank you, Sergio. Um, I also uh, want to build a little bit on some of the ideas that Abby and Sergio have talked about um, as far as building those connections and building the um, relationships amongst uh, not only land um, managers and the biologists that are out there doing the studies and um, managing some of these populations, but also um, the folks that are out there to enjoy the birds and to um, get visitors and tourists along the coast out to some of the areas where these birds use. Um, now, the it is really important to have those kind of partnerships and Abby and I, um, along with some funding with uh, from the Coastal Resources Division of the Georgia Department of Natural Resources, have been working for the last couple of years 
on building a certification program for eco tour guides, mostly water based eco tour guides that take visitors, both local visitors as um, residents, as well as visitors to the Georgia coast out to some of our barrier islands. Um, a lot of these barrier islands are, of course, difficult to reach unless you are in a boat of some sort. So working with uh, the folks that are getting people out there um, feels like a very important um, next step to building some of the consciousness that we have for the shorebirds that are in the area, but also some of the um, conservation challenges that these birds face. So the objectives for the program that Abby and I have been working on um, primarily were, was to reduce recreational disturbance um, of shorebirds in coastal habitats. Of course, taking in account that not only shorebirds but other wildlife use these areas. So really um, looking at the reduction of um, recreational disturbance on all wildlife with that special emphasis on shorebirds. Um, and then of course, incentivizing um, our responsible eco tour guides um, through this certification program that we've been working on building. To do so, um, we worked with a steering committee um, that uh, contained folks that were in all of these different sort of sections of the community from um, biologists like Tim Kyes, um, along with uh, land managers and tour, um, tour guides themselves, and really built up out um, the idea of having a what we thought was going to be an in-person workshop, which turned into a, an online course that had aspects of virtual um, programming discussions through Zoom, and then a field day that we were able to go out with Abby and with Tim um, to identify shorebirds, but also to look at some of the areas um, of potential um, recreational disturbance. The results of the work that we've done, we have recently um, certified our first cohort of uh, eco tour guides. Uh, we have 17 certified guides along the coast of Georgia. So we have folks in Savannah and folks in Brunswick. And if you are looking on getting out onto into the water and, or sorry, onto the water and uh, seeing some of these birds, you can look for our new fancy logo that these certified guides will be using um, to indicate that they are aware of shorebirds and some of the conservation um, limitations for these animals. We also wanted to make sure that um, through the certification process that we were really emphasizing some of those what we're calling no harm rules. Abby mentioned a few of those in the beginning of our program today, um, but certainly being aware that um, shorebirds are out there and they're there during all times of the year. So making sure that we're not flushing um, foraging or resting flocks of shorebirds, um, keeping dogs leashed in places um, along the, the coast to keep those birds um, from being flushed and being threatened um, and, and the other things that you see listed here. Um, I think that uh, just being aware of some of the work that we're doing with, in collaboration with our partners. So Georgia Sea Grant itself working um, to have these collaborative uh, partnerships to support students like Sergio. Um, we have other opportunities for students along the coast as well um, to get involved with Sea Grant um, on all different levels, whether it's our Canals um, Fellowship, um, really, which really works from a policy perspective, or if it's a state fellowship like Sergio's um, to uh, work with land managers and on the ground conservation organizations 
or if it's in environmental education with our education-based Sea Grant fellows that work um, up and down the coast, but primarily here um, out of our Marine Education Center and Aquarium. That's all I have, Kayla, so I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Well, thanks, Katie. And we can go ahead and stop share screen. And if all of our panelists will go ahead and turn on your videos, um, we're going to open it up to Q&A or comments for anyone that you've heard from, Abby, Sergio, or Katie. So take a minute and type in your questions. Um, I know that it may take folks a second to get those questions typed in. I don't see any right now. So in the meantime, I will add that if you want to actually get out and see some of these migrating shorebirds, um, and some of the horseshoe crabs that are spawning. Um, we do have some chances to do that out of our Marine Extension and Georgia Sea Grant facility on Skidaway Island next week. Katie will actually be one of the educators teaching that. Um, registration technically closed yesterday, but I just checked with our captains and they were okay to open it up for another two hours today for anyone that's watching um, to have a chance to register. I was trying to multitask and open our registration while also kind of moderating on the side. So it does not look like it's working on the online public side yet. But if you wanna go, email me before 1.30 uh, today so that we can get your registration all processed by two and our captains can let crew know if there's anyone else that wants to join us on the boats. Um, but with that, I'm looking to see if we have any questions and it does look like we do. Um, someone says, I'm going to the new Smyrna Beach in mid-June. Will I miss all the migration activity? So Abby, this might be a question for you. I don't know where New Smyrna Beach is. Okay, so for um, our person who added that question, if you could add um, in the chat box um, where New Smyrna Beach is, is that in Georgia or elsewhere along the coast? Um, and then there was a question about, will the Skidaway event be online as well? It will not, it will be in person. So that chance to get out on the water, it's limited to one group of up to three people per boat. We've got one boat left for Monday and two boats left for Wednesday. Um, and our person who had asked about the Smyrna Beach says it's the Atlantic side of Florida near Daytona. Yeah, most shorebirds um, are already up in the Arctic. They have a, a very narrow window actually when they leave um, in terms of the migratory Arctic nesting shorebirds because the Arctic nesting season is so short. So usually by the, between the third week of May and that first week of June, they are most mostly heading towards the Arctic. Um, so you may not get to see um, those Arctic nesting birds, but there could still be a few stragglers or um, birds that are not actually going to migrate, whether they're juveniles or birds that just aren't in top condition. So um, keep your eyes out and you might see some of them. And then there will also be beach nesting birds as well. Um, I would say one great resource if you are um, familiar with it is, is checking out eBird. Um, and you can actually go to the website um, of eBird and uh, that is a, a database that birders can contribute to. I keep sending everything just to us. Um, but, uh, but that will let you actually search locations and you can see what have been observed in that area um, before you go. So you can get an idea of who's there before you get there. Awesome. Well, thank you, Abby, for that. Um, and we had another question about when you see horseshoe crabs stranded on the beach, sometimes lying on their back at low tide, should you leave them alone or take them to the water? And so either Abby or Katie, if you want to weigh in on this. Oh, I, I will weigh in. Uh, Kayla and I had that very situation last week. Um, when we went out uh, birding and we saw several horseshoe crabs that had been spawning and the tide was going out very fast. Um, and I think that the, you know, the decision to intervene or not um, is a little bit about whether they are still actively nesting or not. So 
you know, a lot of these animals, if they are coupled and they are actively nesting, um, then you probably want to leave them alone. They're pretty good at digging under and keeping themselves wet, um, even with, you know, our fairly large tidal range that we have. But if they are upside down and they are, they are clearly stranded, there's no harm in taking them to the edge of the water and letting them um, go on their way. Abby, I don't know if you want to add to that. Maybe just one important thing is if you do pick up a horseshoe crab, um, did you say this already? But don't pick it up by the tail. So that um, that tail-like structure is called a telson. It can't sting you. It can't hurt you. It's just used for steering and helping them right themselves if they get upside down. But if you're going to pick one up, grab it from the sides of its shell um, and carry it down to the water. And they are very harmless and really cool creature, so I recommend them. Wonderful, thank you both. And we have um, a few more minutes to take a question or more to you. So if you do have questions, feel free to add those. Or if you yourself have seen any of these animals or have your own experiences or observations to share. And we always like to hear from, from people who are out on the beaches. Um, so while we're waiting for questions from the audience, I have a, a few for you. Um, Sergio, what was the one of the coolest experiences in terms of getting out in the field uh, with the biologists this year for the birds? Yeah, definitely with Abby, Tim, and, uh, and Fletcher going to, uh, at least they've taken me so far to many of the, uh, the sandbanks and seeing just the Quant, like high quantities of, of different shorebirds, like thousands and thousands. And you're seeing them counted and be like, oh, that's a thousand, that's 3,000, 5,000. So that's been mind blowing. And, and you're seeing how they, how they interact with the birds and, and, and how you actually get the data from them. That's been mind opening. <laughs> so definitely props to them. I, I wouldn't be able to, to even imagine what, how, how to even do that if it wasn't for this experience. Well, that's great to hear. And that really does sound like an amazing experience. Um, and I'm curious, so we've really focused on when these migratory birds are here in Georgia, but since it is World Migratory Bird Day, I just think it's fascinating that they go to so many other areas of the world. Um, and I'm curious for anyone, any of the three of you, if you've seen any of these birds we've talked about here in Georgia, if you've seen them in other parts of the world during the work that you've done. Abby, you've been to the Arctic, so you really need to take this. Yeah, um, I, I got to spend a summer in Barrow, Alaska, um, which is not called Barrow anymore. And I apologize for not remembering how to pronounce um, the native name of Barrow, Alaska, but it is definitely not called Barrow anymore. Um, either way, I was there for uh, two months, which is essentially the length of the breeding season. And it was completely eye-opening to me. That was one of my big dreams was going up there and seeing that because I did just feel so strongly that we get to see all the, these migratory birds when they're on our beaches here and knowing that there was so much more to the story, but not being able to see it. Um, so I, I jumped at the opportunity to volunteer at a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service long running um, demographic project in Barrow. So we were basically looking for nests and then banding chicks. And there was some other research going on to look at growth rates and how climate change is impacting shorebird success in the Arctic. Um, but just getting to be in that landscape was incredible. And it gave me so much respect for how, um, how vulnerable and delicate shorebirds are, but how incredibly tough and resilient they are at the same time. Um, during that summer, you know, there were days actually that it was it was snowing even in July um, in the Arctic, and there were little fuzzy, you know, two inch tall shorebird chicks running around on the tundra. And just the the vast landscape is so incredible to me. And I've been lucky enough to be in in a lot of different places where shorebirds go. And to me, one of the coolest things is to just imagine that you know a individual bird knows these landscapes so intimately that they can find food in all of these places and they can find shelter in all of these places. And they really are connecting our whole entire world through their migration. You know, a wimbrel might spend its time down in mangroves in Brazil for the winter and it's eating feather crabs there. 
and then it comes up here in Georgia and it knows the exact patch of salt marsh where it wants to go. And then maybe it goes up um, and nests on the Arctic tundra. And all those landscapes are so different from one another, but those birds are able to um, find what they need and, and be successful. So I think it's incredible. Wow, thanks Abby for sharing that experience with us. That's pretty amazing to think about. Um, and we, we are almost out of time, but we had two more questions come in. Uh, so we have time for some brief answers to both of these. Uh, the first one is actually for Sergio, and um, they're wondering, will Sergio take his knowledge home to Puerto Rico and continue this work, or will he be staying here? Yeah, so, so for the immediate future, my end goal would be to go back to Puerto Rico and, and clearly form a part of uh, the conservation efforts there, but my immediate future would be going to do my PhD uh, after this experience and clearly gathering more 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 uh, information that I that I could be more useful into that and clearly learning more but this is definitely uh, and especially not only the birds but again like that uh, side of conservation that is more into the government or pol political uh, politically inclined that's something that I'm definitely going to take uh, for the rest of my life just gathering that knowledge so definitely well thanks Sergio um, and Abby, are the babies banded with bands they grow into? Um, so many of those shorebird chicks, their legs are actually the same diameter, the same thickness as they will be for their adult life. So um, like the Wilson's plovers, for instance, we band them just as soon as they hatch and their legs won't get any thicker. So they're totally fine to have those bands on them and it doesn't cause them any, um, any trouble at all. Oyster catchers, um, their legs grow a lot as they are growing up from chicks to adult sized birds. And so when we band oyster catchers and you saw a few pictures with the, those banded oyster catchers, those ones we have to actually go out and catch just before they fly when their legs are fully growing. And, and so um, that's a significant challenge um, that Sergio, you'll be a part of soon enough because um, we need fast people to chase shorebird chicks all over the beach. <laughs> Well, that is fascinating. And thank you to um, the person that asked that question, because that's a fascinating one that I don't think I would have thought to ask. So great questions. Um, the next one is, do shorebirds also summer at the South Pole? Um, shorebirds do not go quite so far as the South Pole. But if you look at a map, Tierra del Fuego, the very southern part of South America, um, where they spend um, our winter is Pretty, pretty far south. Um, one of the things that I think is so fascinating is if you think about um, the amount of daylight that a migratory shorebird that goes from Tierra del Fuego all the way up to the Arctic experiences over the course of its lifetime, it's way down in the Southern hemisphere during what is the summer down there, our winter, right? And then they go all the way up to the Arctic in the Northern hemisphere for the summer. So they get summer sunlight nearly their whole entire lives wild. That is so cool to think about. Um, well, thank, thank you to all three of our presenters and panelists. Um, we really appreciate you sharing your experiences and your knowledge. And I know I'm really excited um, to be celebrating these birds and, and take these nuggets of facts with me into the weekend for World Migratory Bird Day. Um, after this event, we'll send a follow-up email. We've got some further resources with a story map about Wimbrels, um, some info from World Migratory Bird Day. If you have children in your life, uh, that website, World Migratory Bird Day, has tons of great coloring sheets and other educational activities, um, including some coloring sheets that highlight, I think, some of the birds you learned about today. Um, and again, if you would like to go out on the boat and see them with Katie in person, um, you have until 1.30 p.m., so an about half an hour after this, we'll say two, we'll give you a full hour, a full hour after this um, to send me a quick email and we can try and, and squeeze in your registration. Um, and if you want to know any more about any of our partners, so Manomet, uh, Georgia Audubon, or um, Jekyll Island Authority, we'll also send those links out in the post email. There will be an evaluation that pops up when this webinar ends. Um, if you can take it only like a minute or two, that really helps us plan for future events um, and also to report on our impacts from doing the virtual programming. Um, and a big thank you to all of uh, the folks that have watched 
And with that, unless anyone else of our presenters anything else to say, um, we'll say goodbye and let you enjoy the rest of your afternoon.